Our God is a great God. He's a loving God, a powerful God, but a merciful God. He's our Abba. He loves us. He cares about us, young and old. And that's the God that you were, you were praising. And you said, if, if all the things of the creation praise him, then so will I. And that, that's what all of us should be thinking and believing here on this Sabbath day that God created and set apart for us to be able to be together on this occasion. So will I. So will I. I hope that, that message comes through to everybody. So will I. Uh, I bring you greetings from Montgomery, Alabama, and all the brethren there. Uh, they are doing well. Uh, they're blessed in so many ways, but they face the challenges that we all face that we heard about in the prayer requests. I also bring you greetings from Kenya, East Africa as well. I was able to go there over atonement, spent about seven days there, and uh, we have a, a leader named Moses. Uh, imagine that. Going back to Africa to meet with Moses. But anyway, he and his family uh, had a chance to spend time with them. And they've got a, uh, a congregation there in the Maasai area of Kenya. And they actually have a school that they've started. About a little over 20 students in the school. Because that's what uh, I encouraged and Dad encouraged them to do. To go ahead and begin educating the, uh, the children there in God's ways. So they didn't get caught up in the world and the world that they live in, which is challenging in many respects. So uh, anyway, I bring you greetings from them. It was wonderful to sit under the avocado trees in, uh, in Africa and talk with these people who were just so genuine, so open, so ready, so joyful. Uh, if you were on the, the bringing on the Sabbath last night, we were talking about joy as a very important part of it. And, uh, and so we can certainly learn something from our brethren in other parts of the world as well. I'd like to say hello to those who are on the connection as well. It's good to be able to speak to you as well today. And I want to answer uh, a question or at least uh, pose a question and give you some possible considerations in answering the question. But if you wanted a title for this sermon, probably the testimony of Jesus Christ would be the title. The testimony of Jesus Christ. And I want to begin in Deuteronomy chapter 4. The testimony of Jesus Christ. What is that? Well, Revelation defines it as the spirit of prophecy. Spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And we're going to talk at, at the end of the sermon about the spirit of prophecy and, and prophecy and what that means in our context today. But Deuteronomy go, establishes a foundation for this testimony of Jesus Christ because we know that it was actually Jesus Christ who was there speaking to them from the mountain, meeting with Moses, and encouraging the people and giving them a law. Deuteronomy chapter 4, Now therefore, this one who became Jesus Christ, the word, spoke to them, saying, Listen, O Israel, to the statutes and to the judgments which I am teaching you to do, so that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor shall you take anything from it, so that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And he talks about their slipping into the worship of another god called Baal of Peor, and how that had led to problems for them. But in verse 5, Deuteronomy 4, verse 5, it says, See, I have taught you statutes and judgments. Just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do so in the land where you are entering to possess. Therefore, keep and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great? who has God so near to it as the Lord our God is in all things whenever we call on him. The question is, does God 
work miracles today. And I say the answer is yes. And I want to go ahead and talk about some examples of that. But I I guess the important thing is, do you believe that God works miracles today? Now, there can be an issue with defining what a miracle is, because I've heard an ad about this, what they call a miracle network. A miracle network, which is, you know, people giving funds to support uh, various uh, activities that help people with their physical problems, you know, uh, medically, otherwise. And it's called a miracle network because uh, of the changes it accomplishes in people's lives from a physical point of view. But I'm not talking about miracles in the sense of, you know, those things that can be done to help somebody uh, who is struggling in life, who has health problems. Talking about those things that are inexplicable, those things that are, uh, are absolutely unexplainable. You can't have any other uh, answer but that God was there and God was doing that. Just like we read in Deuteronomy here. The nations will know that God is in your midst. You will have the testimony of Jesus Christ when God is able to work those things that are inexplicable, those things that are incredible, that are beyond the power of man to be able to accomplish and do. And so that's an important question for us to consider because obviously the witness that we need to bring to the world is that God is still in our midst. And God still does those things. Now, one of the reasons why I felt like I wanted to give this message to you today is that I I spoke at a feast site a number of years back. Uh, It's only been two or three years, I guess. And I described a miraculous intervention that I was aware of. I had a number of people who had testified to it, that it had happened. And it involved particularly my father and the fact that there was a baby that was brought to him while he was in a Days of Unleavened Bread service. And they, uh, they, this mother, he was called out of the service and she thrust a dead baby. He had been dead for over an hour. And, uh, and she said, my baby, my baby's dead. Do something. Help me. And uh, anyway, the upshot of the story is that as a minister of God, he went down and he prayed for that child with a, a few, couple other witnesses there. And that baby came back to life, was restored to life. This is back in the 19... Uh, 1950s, late 50s, maybe early 60s. I don't remember the exact date. But it was, uh, it was uh, definitely an inexplicable occurrence. But there was no reason that child not only would be restored to life, but also not having suffering uh, catastrophic problems because of being without air for that period of time. But the reason I'm, I'm speaking about this today is I got a call a little while after I'd, the feast had ended, and I got a call from somebody who called and said, have you got proof that that really happened? Have you got proof? Do you have your line of witnesses, you know, who are going to say that? Because the, the concern that the, the individual had was that, you know, how could I as a minister of God get up there and talk about something unless I had, had all these people lined up to corroborate it? Because there are people out there who don't believe that God really works that way anymore. There are people that believe that God shut off the miracles after what was called the apostolic age, that that we don't have those things happening today, now. That God is not quite as near to us today as he has been in the past. And I say that is not true. And I want uh, us to consider that. God wants us to consider that because how near is our God to us? How well do we know him and know that he is able and willing to answer our requests? Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. So I want to, uh, want to give reference to this uh, 
particular terminology, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12 speaks about a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, with 12 stars on her head, and uh, that she gave birth to a child, a male child who will rule all nations with an iron scepter, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Well, we know who that is, don't we? The one who is our Lord and our Savior, and it speaks about her being taken to this place to be protected for a period of time. But at the end of that chapter, Revelation 12 and verse 17, after the dragon seeks to destroy the woman and is unable to do it, says that then the dragon was angry with the woman and he went to wage war with the remnant of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we're here today because we're keeping God's Sabbath day, right? That is a commandment, the fourth commandment. And we have the commandments of God. We uh, observed the fall feast not long ago. That is a commandment. And certainly, you know, we believe in keeping God's commandments. But what I'd like to focus on is the second part of that, these offspring of the woman who not only have the commandments of God, but the testimony, the evidence of Jesus Christ being near to them, being in them, that it's bringing about a transformation that is inexplicable. It's bringing about miraculous interventions that couldn't come from any other source. That they are representations of the power of Almighty God. That's the testimony we are to be bringing to this world. That we're not subject to all the futility and the frustrations of this world just like anybody else out there. Because we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, are we not? Isn't that what the, the scriptures say? We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And you know, we were talking last night about joy. When we know that, when we believe that, and when we are experiencing that, there's not, nothing that's going to come from us but a great joy, even in trials. I mean, James says that we're supposed to rejoice even in tribulation, aren't we? And I think about, I'm reminded of Paul and how he'd been beaten and put into the prison and he was in the stocks there, but what was he doing? He was singing praises to God, wasn't he? He was lifting up God in a very painful, difficult circumstance. Because there was the testimony of Jesus Christ in his life. He knew that even though circumstances didn't look very good at that time, that he knew who was there with him. And we need to know who is with us each and every day. We need to know that God is with us and he does marvelous things. Well, when we look at Jesus Christ... What would you say is perhaps one of the greatest miracles he ever performed while he was on this earth? Think about it for a second. Give you a chance. You know, we could talk about casting out demons, right? Uh, the, the little girl, the, the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman who was tormented by a demon, or the boy who was tormented by the demon that threw him in the water and in the fire. And that was certainly a great miracle. And we could talk about the little girl, Talitha Kumi, little girl arise. But obviously Lazarus would be a very significant miracle that he performed. That for four days, this man, this friend of his had been dead and he, he stayed back for a little while, didn't he? Stayed back till they'd, they'd have him buried for four days. And he, he loved Elizabeth and he loved Mary, and, but he waited because God's glory was going to be revealed. The testimony of Jesus Christ was going to be evident there. And yet even in spite of knowing that, it says that Jesus wept, didn't he? Because he, he really had a heart for the people and he saw the pain and suffering they were going through. He knew what he was going to do. And so Lazarus... As we hear the story, you know, he said, uh, Lazarus, come out of there after they'd removed the stone. And what was the attitude of the sister when he said, remove the stone? She said, oh, Lord, you don't want to do that. It's been four days, and so it's going to be, a, you know, it's, he's decaying, right? 
He's decomposing. And he said, what did I tell you? Believe. Believe. And they moved the stone aside and he said, Lazarus, come out. And out he comes, all bound up in the burial clothes, right? Stumbling out. And he said, let him go. And there was great rejoicing. But you know, that signed the death warrant for Jesus' life. It ended his life because at that point, the Pharisees and the leaders had no choice, but they had to kill him. They had to kill him. And so it wasn't very long after that that they actually did that. But if you think about Lazarus, Certainly, it was a great miracle that he came walking out of there. But where is Lazarus today? He's still dead. You know, he's physically dead, isn't he? He went back to the grave. Because he lived out whatever life God gave to him after that resurrection in a physical body. And then he went back to the grave again. So what is a greater miracle? Isn't it the raising up of people from death in this world and in this carnal physical flesh into eternal life. Isn't that the greater miracle? That he can transform us from those who are dead in their trespasses and sins into those who are living a victorious life in Jesus Christ, who are able to be a witness and a light for Jesus Christ in the world. Because they know that the power is there. They know that they have access to God at a moment's notice. They can go into the Holy of Holies and ask for his intervention, ask for his deliverance. And he stands ready to answer them. Why couldn't Jesus do many mighty works in his own hometown? What was the problem? They, they didn't believe. They said, oh, this, this guy is Joseph's son. Joseph and Mary's son. He can't be anybody important. And it wasn't about whether or not they recognized him as being uh, a, a person of importance by himself. It was whether they recognized him as being God. And do we recognize God? Let's go to Acts 9. I want to go ahead and look through a, a very powerful example of God's miracles. And again, we're coming up to our day today. So uh, be patient. Acts chapter 9, after Jesus Christ had died himself and been resurrected and returned to the Father, he sent the Spirit to different people. And and, uh, in Acts chapter 9, we find the conversion of a man named Saul. Saul was breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And so he went to the high priest and he asked for permission to go to the synagogues in Damascus and find anybody who followed the way there and bring them back to Jerusalem for punishment. What happened? Well, on the way, he's going up there. He's, he knows what, what direction he's going to go. But all of a sudden, this light comes shining down on him. He's, he's struck down there in the road on the way to Damascus. And he hears the voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And he was blind for a period of time until Ananias came to him. And that was an interesting miracle all by itself because Ananias was told, go and pray for this man, Saul of Tarsus. And he said, "Uh, Lord, (laughs) I... Do you know about Saul of Tarsus? He's got a letter from the high priest to come and arrest anybody who follows that way. And you want me to walk over there and pray for him? Yes, I do. So will I, right? So will I. You know, that, that's where you have to say, so will I. Be ready to do whatever God calls you to do. And so uh, Ananias prays for him and the scales fall off his eyes and, and he immediately begins to preach Jesus Christ. So... Paul, or Saul, who became known as Paul, made a transference from the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of of death and the flesh into eternal life. He wasn't changed with a glorified body, no, but he was now a representative of God, an ambassador of Jesus Christ, with the testimony of Jesus Christ to take to the world, particularly the Gentiles. And what happened with that? Acts 13, and these are passages, I'm looking over them quickly. I would encourage you to read through them as you have opportunity. So 
Saul was in Antioch with other leaders of the church there, Acts 13, the church that was in Antioch. There were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they worshipped the Lord and fasted. And the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. This is a testimony of Jesus Christ because it wasn't that they were doing things the way they chose to do things. They were humbling themselves before God saying, God, what do you want us to do? How do we go forward? And we really need that testimony in, in the churches today. That we're really hearing from God and receiving a spiritual direction for the church because we are living in very important very serious times. And we need to know that when we're going forward, we're be going forward fully with the leadership and support and encouragement of God's Spirit, which is going to back it up, the work that we're doing with the miraculous works of God that are inexplicable. It's not just something we can do on our own. Anybody can do the works of the flesh, right? Some people are more skilled than us. Who did God call to be a part of his church? The great and the mighty, mostly? Or the weak and the foolish? The ones who are not considered very highly in this world. But God says, I am going to make something out of you that will be inexplicable. I stand before you as a miracle of God today. There's no way I would be standing here in front of you today, except for the fact that there is a God in heaven who calls his people and sets them apart and sets them on a path in life. I believe many of you, most of you, hopefully all of you, are also a miracle. That God saw you and he said, I've got a plan, I've got a purpose, I'm working out, I've got a job for you to do, a part for you to play in it, just like... He did Saul here. We can tend to look at Saul and say, well, you know, I never had a Damascus moment. You know, I didn't have the light shining on me. But I think you did. I think we all did. Just maybe we didn't recognize it because it wasn't as obvious as his was. You know, I think about when I was baptized, and I grew up in, in association with the Church of God, the Churches of God. And I was 22 years old when I finally decided to get baptized. Now, it wasn't because I was vacillating between one opinion or another. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to follow God, but I wasn't quite perfect yet. I, I, I see you can appreciate my quandary. You know, I was, I was trying, I'd always tried to be a good person, live up to uh, being that testimony for God that I needed to be. And I failed sometimes. You know, it, it, it would probably be considered little ways by many people. I wasn't out there doing all the things everybody else was doing, but I, I kind of felt like, well, I've got to get all this in line, and when I've got all my ducks in a row, then I'll go and get baptized, because then I'm, I'm sure I'm going to make it. Well, obviously that didn't happen. I can remember even praying one time in Pasadena, California, on my knees in a prayer closet and say, God, I know I need to repent of something, but I honestly can't think of what it is right now. <laughs> Let me encourage you, that's not a challenge you want to throw out to God, okay? <laughs> it wasn't very long before I was back in the same prayer closet saying, God, that'll do for now. <laughs> he has a way of... of uh, you know, bringing the light into your life and showing you how far short you really fall of what he wants you to be, what he, he hopes you will become. The kind of man, the kind of woman, the kind, kind of teenager, the kind of child he wants you to be. And so, anyway, I got baptized. And that was a miracle. Because I got up out of that water and it was just this, this sudden overwhelming sense that I am perfectly sinless right now. Every sin I have ever committed in thought or in action or word or anything was just washed away completely by a work of Almighty God. 
And that was, a, that was an exhilarating feeling. It wasn't just the, the water and the, the, the minister who performed it. He was joking with me. He said, well, we're almost ready for the baptism. The ice hasn't quite melted yet. It was in a, a cattle trough so in, in his basement. But he, he was having a little fun with me. You know what I was worried about? I was worried I was, could, could hold my breath long enough. I didn't know how long they were going to hold me under. <laughs> but I came out and I realized... <laughs> God sees me sinless right now. That's a miracle. That is a gift of God that, that is inexplicable. Now, uh, what was my response humanly to it? I'm going to go just as long as I can without sinning. And I probably made it to that thought, right? It got proud or whatever. But that was a miracle. It, it was an amazing thing to realize that, that the creator of everything had looked down and seen me as being somehow useful in his purpose. I just want to encourage all of you, whether you're sitting here in Texas or whether you're out there, uh, you know, in wherever location you are, that God looks down and he performs a miracle because he says, I can use that one. And I hope he's performing that miracle in your life right now. This day. That he's saying, I'm going to set you apart and I'm going to do great things through you. Inexplicable things through your life. I want to, let me just share a couple things. And I guess I'll, I'll be, I'll be like Paul who in 2 Corinthians said, bear with me a little while. I'm really bragging about God. Okay, this isn't about me. This is about God, uh, my God, who has done marvelous things. When I grew up, my dad, because of personal challenges and issues he was facing, was not able to be there. My mom was raising eight children by herself. We had to live on food stamps in a small community. You know, I didn't know how important that was until I became a pastor and I was given an opportunity to counsel a young a teenage boy in Mississippi. Because he was growing up, his mom was raising him and, and uh, he was struggling as a teenage boy to be able to put, make sense out of everything. And, and so as we were talking, I was talking to him and his mom because they were struggling. He said, well, Mr. Glover, you just don't know what it's like to live in a small town and have to take food stamps to the only food store. I said, well, son, now that's where you're wrong. Been there. Done that. And I knew then God had, had performed a miracle in the circumstances that he'd brought it around full circuit, that I was able to use that to encourage this young man there, this teenage boy there in Mississippi. But growing up in that circumstance, I was just coasting along. I was just going to church and doing, being dutiful. I was going to school and, you know, just kind of had some ideas about what I might be doing in the future. And you know what? None of them was this. Not a single thought about this. No way. I, my kids can't believe it. I tell them, when I was growing up, I was very shy. And they say, oh, what happened? A miracle, that's what happened. I, 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 was, I was the one in the group. Uh, I, there's some of them here, probably among the young people. When you get together, you're, you're the one who just kind of sits and listens to everybody else while they're chatting. You know, you got the, the, the chatty ones, the ones that will just talk and talk. Well, I was the one sitting back there. I was part of the group, but I, I wasn't getting out there and participating in it. And then God opened an opportunity for me to come to Big Sandy, Texas in 1977 for a youth conference. That was a miracle. It was a miracle in my life because it changed the whole direction of my life. I came down here. There were 600 some odd kids from all over the world who were here in Big Sandy uh, and I went away saying, you know what, the world out there is a whole lot bigger and brighter than I even imagined. 
And as a result, I ended up applying to Ambassador College, was accepted, and, and went to the college. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. But I want to just briefly mention a couple things, uh, one in particular. While I was going to college, I went in three years. I completed the coursework in three years. And so my, uh, my second year, which would have been my junior year, I wanted to go on the Jerusalem Dig Project. I wanted to go over there and be an amateur archaeologist. I said that, didn't I? I wanted, I wanted to go over and, and find something really spectacular over in the city of David. But also, I wanted to go out and experience a little bit more of that big wide world out there. But the problem was, so I, was I was a broke student. I had barely gotten enough money to get into my second year of college. And you had to, the, the requirement was you had to pay off all of your student debt or you couldn't go. And I was working and working at the jobs that I was working at on campus. And I, I was calculating and trying to figure it out. But I said, I said, you know, there's no way. I'm barely going to pay off my bill, let alone have whatever, however many thousands of dollars it might have taken to go to Jerusalem. So what I said is, well, it's just not going to work. Uh, I'm going to be a senior next year, so I probably won't have an opportunity. So this is just an opportunity that, that I'm going to miss. And I wasn't going to apply. You know what God did? He put it in my mind. Stephen, do you believe in me or not? If I want you to go to Jerusalem for that dig, don't you think I can make the way possible for you? But I can't do that if you don't apply. You're making up my mind for me, Stephen. Instead of letting me show you what I will do for someone who puts it out there, who trusts in me. And so I, I was convicted. I said, all right, I'm going to apply. And then I'm going to pray. Because I don't know how this is going to work. And I applied and was accepted. That wasn't even a, a sure thing because they had a lot of people applied for the DIG project. But I got accepted and so I went back to that prayer closet. I must have put in a lot of time on that, in that prayer closet. I'm sure others can, re, uh, can relate to that. And I said, Father, okay, you, you've taken me this far. I've gotten accepted, but I still don't have the money. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but one thing after another happened that was inexplicable. One that I might mention is uh, an individual who was a resident assistant that year decided they wanted to spend time building a relationship with a young lady. And so they said, I, I, I'm going to, for the second half of the year, I'm going to step out as a resident assistant. And they gave it to me, and so scholarship for uh, a portion. So that helped in paying off the bill. But there were just uh, numerous other things that happened that it just started to open up. The way started opening up. I had the money available that I didn't know how it was going to come, but it started to come. And anyway, the, uh, the upshot of it was I was calculating my paychecks, and my last paycheck was going to be $100. And I owed $100. I had just gotten one of those little receipts in my mailbox that said I owed $100 to the college. So, all right, $100 I owe. And I have $100, but I need $100 to take with me on the dig. So back to the prayer closet again. Uh, God, I don't know how you're going to work this out. I'm, I'm coming, I've come so close. $100 away from it. But I'm, I'm just asking you to somehow uh, work this out for me. But I know I need to pay my bill. So I took that last paycheck. I got my last paycheck in and went to accounting office, and I said, I'm Stephen Glover, and I'm here to pay off the last of my bill. And they went back and looked and came up, and they said, oh, well, you don't owe anything. Your bill is zero. And I'm like, what? And I, I said, well, would you check that again? Stephen Glover, S-T-E-P-H, you know, check it again for me? And uh, they went back and said, no, your bill is zero. So I said, oh, God, I don't know how you did that, but to the penny. To the penny, to the dollar. 
I had exactly what I needed to go on one of the most outstanding experiences in my lifetime. Why? Because number one, I stepped out to apply. I heard what God had to say. That it was a lack of faith in me not trusting him to be able to make the way. And then he made the way. And so it, that was a miracle. That was a miracle that, that really transformed my life in so, so many ways. That experience over there. And I've been able to use it uh, greatly in, in the time that's passed. You know, it helped me to have confidence in the year 2000 because I'd been a pastor of the church group for a number of years. And my family, I had nine children. We had six by birth and we adopted three more. So I had nine children and a wife depending on me. And all of a sudden the church was telling me unless I changed what I taught, unless I started leading people in a different direction, that I was no longer going to have employment there. And some people were concerned that, you know, that might be difficult. But the lessons that I learned earlier made it actually very simple. I said, no, God's never failed me or my family yet, and he's not going to start now. So I don't know what I'm going to have to do. Maybe I'd have to do, as uh, Jeff was saying, uh, get a real job. <laughs> and I asked him after he said, uh, you know, get a real job. I said, so you're not doing a real job now? And he, he got it qualified it a little bit. But anyway, if I needed to go do that, so be it. If that's what God's path and uh, way for me forward was, well, then I accepted that. But putting the confidence in him and I saw his deliverance all the way throughout the ministry that, that I'm blessed to work with there in Montgomery, we have our own building. We own it. Go figure. There's, there's no way that, that could have happened any other way than God has blessed and continues to bless us. We, we continue to do that. Getting in contact with the Church of God International, being able to work together, going and visiting uh, churches with the Church of God International, that was a, a wonderful miracle that God accomplished. Bringing us together, his body together. And, and so there are just so many circumstances that, that I could look to. But I want to go ahead and let's go to Galatians chapter 1. Going back to the word of God here. Galatians chapter 1. These are scriptures that have tremendous meaning for me because I know that God continues to answer. Uh, he continues to give interventions even in, in physical ways. God still heals today. He still heals his people who trust in him. Anointing is an important thing that God has given to us. Uh, uh, going to the, calling the elders of the church and asking to be prayed for. Asking them to pray with the prayer of faith and knowing that God is going to hear and God will answer. God will answer. We need, to, we need to make sure that we are absolutely certain of that. That we uh, can't have that testimony of Jesus Christ in our lives. Galatians 1 and verse 11. Again, we were talking about Paul and, and all that God did through him, leading him. In verse 11 it says, But I reveal to you, brothers, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, man, neither was I taught it, except by a revelation of Jesus Christ. Those of us who are called to be a part of God's church, his family, his people today, you have the access to a direct revelation of God's will in your life. You have access to God's Holy Spirit. I'm thankful to be able to come over here and, and speak to you, but... You're not dependent on me to come tell you what God's will is for your life, are you? Because God gave his spirit to all the body. And through that spirit, he gives us revelation to understand what his will and purpose is for our life, for our family, for our circumstances. Just like he did give me that conviction when I was younger and, and uh, less mature. Uh, I guess I hope I'm more mature now. But... 
God will give you the guidance you need. And we need that guidance. We need the testimony of Jesus Christ that we know that we're walking in his revelation day by day. Because the world we're living in is a very troubled world. The circumstances we face are very challenging today. And we need to see and know the direct divine intervention of God in our lives every single day. Whether it be with our children, with the schools that they encounter, you know, they're having things they're having to deal with in school or university. You know, the, the, uh, they're challenged today. It's a hard world to live in and hard world to have faith in. But we're called to be a witness and a light in that world. And that means we need to have that revelation of Jesus Christ, him revealing himself in us and through us in the world. That's what the calling is. That's what the gospel message is. It's about all of us doing our part to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So he said, I I received a revelation of Jesus Christ, for you've heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church beyond measure and tried to destroy it, And I progressed in Judaism above many of my equals in my own heritage, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who set me apart since I was in my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the nations, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face to the churches of Judea which were in Christ. They had heard only, he who persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which he once destroyed. And they glorified God because of me. You know, we can read that about Paul. That needs to be true about every one of our lives. That God uniquely called us and he set us apart and he is revealing himself in and through us. And there's no lie in that. We walk in the truth. We live in the power of God. Let's go to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians 4. Colossians 4 and verse 2. What do we need to do to manifest, to demonstrate the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, it says in verse 2, continue in prayer. Continue in prayer. And that means not just occasionally. That means we pray without ceasing. We are seeking God not only daily, but continually throughout the day. Continue in prayer. Jesus Christ said, my father's house is to be what? It's a house of prayer, isn't it? It's built upon prayer. And prayer needs to be a communication with a God who is real, who who does exist. What does Hebrews tell us? That faith is the belief that God not only is, but he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's a, a description of faith. Not only believing that God exists, knowing that God exists, but then diligently pursuing him and knowing that he's going to reward your diligence in pursuing him. Not only in this life, because isn't that what he said to the apostles, the disciples, that before he had had died, and they asked him, Lord, we forsook everything to come follow you. He said, well, I'll bless you. I'll provide for you not only in this life, but in the, the age to come with eternal life. So God wants to bless his people. God wants to be with us in a a very powerful way, but we have to be responsive. Continue in prayer and be watchful with thanksgiving while praying also for us that God would open to us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains, that I may reveal it clearly as I ought to speak, 
You need to walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. I personally feel like the challenge that faces the church today is fulfilling the the instruction and revelation to come out of her, my people. Not that we're, uh, believe me, I'm not saying we're going to set up a tent city out in the woods somewhere, okay? That's not where we're going with that. But coming out of her, Jesus Christ prayed that we would be in the world, but not of the world, right? Isn't that what he prayed for his disciples? They're, they're going to have to live in the world because you can't be a, a witness to the world if you're living off in a hermit's cave somewhere. So we have to live in the world, but we have to not be of the world. We have to walk in wisdom. And what does he say? Be wise as what? Serpents and as harmless as Doves. That's our calling. That's the testimony of Jesus Christ. We're wise. We recognize what's going on. And what's going on is evil, frankly. The world is out there trying to destroy your faith. And it's trying to take our children and turn them into, uh, into those who follow its systems, its ways. And, and we've got to take them back. I don't think that's optional. I don't believe that's just something that we say, well, it'd be a good idea, but how do we do it? I think we say, God, reveal to us the way. Reveal to us the way so that we can take our children back and give that testimony of Jesus Christ to them. Pass on the greatest heritage we have to give. I can't give my children a lot as far as this world is concerned. But what I do want to give them is a belief and a knowledge that God is real, God is there, and God loves them and wants to bless them and wants to bless us as his people. We're blessed to have a a church school there in Montgomery. We uh, had our nine children and we educated all of them. And that's challenging. It's challenging because when you're, you're the parents, the pastor, the teachers, you know, the kids after a while are saying, you know, couldn't we get somebody else in here for one of these jobs occasionally? Uh, because they, you're always there together and working on things together. So there are challenges that come with that. But I, I wouldn't trade it for anything because we... Uh, now we've got grandchildren involved in the school, and we sit and we talk about God and his love for us and his power uh, on a daily basis through the week. We start off the day in school with that, the testimony of Jesus Christ that we need to have. So walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, wisely using the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you should answer everyone. Paul's saying this is, this is the testimony that we need to bring. And, and frankly, it's a, it's a miracle that, that we're able to do that. Isn't that what he said? That you'll even be called before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Don't try to come up with a good speech. Have my word in your heart and in your mind. And when you're there, it's going to just flow from you. You're going to know what to say and when to say it. So we have a a tremendous calling. One last passage in 1 Corinthians, chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14, it says, Follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Remember I said that Revelation refers to the testimony of Jesus Christ as the spirit of prophecy. That doesn't mean uh, primarily that you're going to go out and tell future events before they happen. That means it means something else here, Paul referring to it. Was it say he goes on verse two, for he who speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him, although in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks to men, and this is the key to prophecy. He who prophesies speaks to men for their edification and exhortation 
and comfort. That's the testimony of Jesus Christ. When we're able to uh, speak to people in a way that edifies them, that builds them up, it exhorts them, it pushes them along, and it comforts them because we all face problems and trials along the way. And the testimony of Jesus Christ is when all of us as individual members of that one body are really working at peak performance. Now, Jesus Christ made it very plain. We can't, we can't claim age as an out. Okay, I'm, I'm older. I'm weaker. I've got this problem or that problem. Because he says, my strength is made perfect in what? In your weakness. When we are weak, then we are strong. When we realize that our sufficiency is not based upon our ability, our wisdom, our understanding, but upon the God who created us for his purpose, who is making us a people that we read about in Deuteronomy, a people who are set apart. He took them out of Egypt and he taught them in the wilderness. They couldn't fulfill that calling because they didn't have the spirit. I love the example of Eldad and Medad where you know, Moses is calling the elders to come up to the, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and Eldad and Medad were out in the camp, and God still gave them the spirit out there. And they started to prophesy in the middle of the camp. And word got to Joshua saying, hey, you've got to go tell Eldad and Medad to be quiet out there. And what was Moses' response? He said, oh, if only... <laughs> If only everybody in Israel had God's spirit and was speaking prophetically, that would make my job a whole lot easier. Well, God's called the church now, his church, and he says, I'll give my spirit to you. And as you continue in the prayer and worshiping and serving God, then he says, I will bless you. I will guide you. I will give you those gifts. So it says we should desire those, those spiritual gifts but prophecy which speaks to edification, to exhortation, and to comfort. I hope and, and it is my prayer and desire that a miracle has been done here today. That in some hearts and minds, my heart, mind as well, that change has occurred. Something inexplicable. That we are more prepared now because if we just come here and, and we do all the church things, right? We get together and we, we sing the songs and we have a sermon and then we go eat some food, I imagine, afterwards and visit and fellowship for a while and, and then go off to our homes and our families. Then that's not the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ is that what we do here and what we do now will impel us and move us to say we're going to be better this coming week and this coming month and this coming year. We're going to be better at giving that testimony in every aspect of our life, every opportunity. That we're going to be able to tell about what God has done for us. I think, I think sometimes we're afraid to, to talk about that. People might think, well, what are, you talk, uh, what are you bragging that God did this? No, yeah, brag about God. And sometimes we're, we don't talk about the little things that God does. If, if obviously some great miracle happens, then probably we'd be more ready to tell about that. But we, we need to see the miracles that God does every single day in calling us and setting us apart and, and calling us his people that the nations might know. What did it say? That God is among you. Brothers and sisters, be that testimony. Live that testimony. Let people know God is here.